Thanks for joining. Great. Thanks, Jay. Um, so for those that don't know us, I'm Luke Wilson. And John Lockman is my co-presenter and co-creator uh, on the Omnia project. It's a open source, community-driven framework for software-defined deployment of HPC, AI, and high-performance data analytics clusters. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what Omnia is from a very high level, and then we're going to jump right into a demo showing how you can use it to set up multiple clusters uh, from the same, uh, the same Omnia deployment from a single control plane, uh, and then how you can um, use those clusters for all sorts of different workloads from you know, running uh, singularity containers in Slurm to running entire platforms on Kubernetes uh, like Kubeflow. So why, why Omnia? Why run this, pro why do this project? What, what, what was not working that we needed to fix? And the, the, the thing that has changed over the last few years is the way that we look at um, research compute platforms. We no longer, um, look at research compute platforms in the same way we did when the, the Beowulf revolution sort of began as a set of homogeneous resources all tied together with a, um, a very high-speed fabric. But instead, we have that same high-speed fabric with a whole host of different heterogeneous building blocks. And that's heterogeneity both at the, the system level with different types of servers, but also heterogeneity inside the server um, with different uh, memory hierarchies, different accelerators, um, you know, ranging from, you know, GPU acceleration from all sorts of different vendors, FPGA acceleration from different vendors. And then if anyone's been keeping up with the, uh, the deep learning ASIC landscape, there are dozens of um, startups out there that are trying to build special purpose ASICs or special purpose FPGA configurations that um, make the process of doing deep learning uh, more efficient. And, uh, and deep learning, uh, and machine learning, we really think of as um, another type of HPC workload. HPC is the infrastructure we run it on. Um, simulation and modeling has been the traditional workload set, but now we're looking at building artificial intelligence models as another workload on top of those HPC environments. And, and because of that, we need to embrace uh, more rapid software deployment techniques. We typically install um, software on top of the OS layer, but we really need to start looking at how to build systems that are container native from the very start. How do we get that bare metal maximum performance, taking advantage of the different infrastructure, uh, different uh, chip ISAs, but still putting software in that container uh, so that we can take the burden off the system administrator, honestly. It's very difficult um, for system administrators to keep up with all of the different combinations of software packages, especially when you use multiple compilers, multiple uh, MPI stacks and whatnot. Um, the, the combinatorial list of different variants of the same software package can get enormous. And then when you try and put mul multiple dozens of software tools on top of a system, um, you can have entire teams of HPC professionals uh, devoting their entire careers to just recompiling your software. Um, we also want to be able to do things in a very software defined way. You know, clustering is something that began in high performance computing. Um, but it didn't end there. The enterprise space has um, really started to build infrastructure at the data center level that looks very similar to what um, we, uh, the HPC community would do uh, in terms of clusters with high-speed fabrics, um, although typically ethernet um, being used to join together hundreds or thousands of different compute nodes uh, together. And they've used a lot of new techniques that um, have not really been adopted in the HPC community, but we think it's it's time to, to absorb some of those lessons from the enterprise space, from the cloud service provider space, and, and look at building systems in a very software defined way, um, mainly because the types of workloads we use, do today um, are not the same. We don't need to necessarily set up a system um, one time, run it for four or five years, and then decommission the whole thing with the software and hardware intimately tied to one another. Um, we need to be able to rapidly deploy logical solutions on top of a pool of resources that may be changing over time. You know, you may be doing rolling upgrades of your infrastructure um, on an annual basis or every 18 months rather than waiting for um, one large investment every three to five years. And so we want to be able to bring those practices into the HPC community. And so that's why we started uh, the Omnia project. Um, 
which is really a way of doing what we're used to doing, building the same types of infrastructure we're, we're accustomed to in, a, in an infrastructure as code way, a software defined way, um, and allowing us to do uh, some interesting things with uh, new workload managers, new container orchestration layers, and um, new logical cluster deployment. So we don't tie the entirety of the, the resource pool to a single cluster. We can actually build small logical clusters inside of a single resource pool. So we're no longer provisioning and deploying a cluster. We're provisioning a data center and then deploying clusters within that data center. Um, and the Omnia ecosystem is really built on two independent components. I say independent because you know, the second component is not dependent on the first. You can actually run um, the second piece without the first. And the first piece is bare metal provisioning. Um, we can detect new infrastructure and apply a minimal operating system configuration in preparation for cluster deployment. And then the second piece is the intelligent deployment part. You don't have to use the bare metal provisioning um, in order to use this. Um, but the intelligent deployment creates new logical clusters using a pool of provisioned infrastructure, network switches, and storage resources. So um, by having this pool of resources available, we can configure and deploy these logical clusters running right on top of it, um, which can be stood up very quickly. Uh, we're actually going to walk through developing a handful of, um, of clusters uh, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but you can also uh, tear down those clusters very quickly if you're done using them. Uh, and then as the project grows, one of our next steps will be um, making it uh, simple to shrink and grow those clusters as well. So as you add new resources to the resource pool, you can grow your clusters. Um, if you decide that you're done with one cluster and you wanna add its resources to a different one, you can tear down a cluster and then grow a, a subsequent cluster uh, using those re remaining resources. Let me start really quick by talking about the bare metal provisioning part. Um, and this is new in, in the, the latest version of Omnia. We uh, just released Omnia 1.0 in March and uh, bare metal provisioning is new to 1.0. Uh, before in our O.X uh, releases, we had only the intelligent deployment, but now we have this bare metal provisioning component that takes care of two pieces. Uh, first, um, we build a system, uh, a control plane system based on Cobbler and AWX, which is all bootstrapped by Omnia itself. Um, and that gives us um, a place from which we can uh, deploy uh, a minimal OS. We can do the OS provisioning with Cobbler, and then we can absorb the, the inventory created by Cobbler through those DHCP Pixie requests um, back into AWX, which is a graphical user interface that provides um, uh, direct access to, to Ansible. And so in this sense, the bare metal provisioning component really only does these two parts. It provides a minimal operating system. We currently use CentOS 7.9 minimal, um, but we have added support in Omnia for, for CentOS 8 and, and all of the other RHEL clones. So RHEL 8, CentOS 8, Rocky Linux 8, as it, it's coming out right now, Alma Linux. So all of those variants will be supported um, because we're using the standard repositories when we do our intelligent deployment. Uh, but then as those nodes are added to the system um, and they are provisioned with an operating system, the, the information about those hosts is ingested back into AWX. So we automatically have a list of nodes in our resource pool we can then use to apply a, a logical cluster on top of. And so um, if we come back to this picture, we, we've seen how the bare metal provisioning part works. It's very straightforward, very simple. In fact, that's the entire philosophy of the Omnia project is to do everything as simply and straightforward as possible we want. Um, we never want to do anything in, a, in an overly complex way. We never want to put any pieces together in a way where they are intimately related to one another. That way, you can pull pieces out, replace them with other parts, um, and build an extensible ecosystem of capabilities using the Omnia framework. Um, the second part is the intelligent deployment, and this is the part that is in in Ansible. And like I said, we use it to create these logical clusters on top of this provisioned resource pool. And so the way that um, the intelligent deployment component works is it, it does three different phases. So um, everything we do in Omnia is written in Ansible. And so we use Ansible's built-in 
um, fact gathering system with a few uh, little additions to inspect each server as we begin the deployment process. And the inspection uh, consists of analyzing the existing configuration that includes the operating system um, and the, the set of uh, accelerators or, in, or networking cards that are attached to it. So we do a uh, we do a standard Ansible fact gathering to get the basic things like OS distribution, um, at major minor releases, those types of things. But we also do a customized inspection of the PCI bus using LSPCI to find all of the different peripherals and devices that are hooked up to that system so that we know what is in the box and we can then move on to the install phase where we deploy the right software packages for the server based on that inspection of its configuration. If we detect NVIDIA GPUs inside of a box, for example, we will install the NVIDIA GPU drivers. If we detect AMD GPUs inside the box, we will install the AMD GPU drivers and so on and so forth. And so it gives us a very flexible way of adding new hardware to uh, support to the ecosystem and easily integrating those installation components. Once we install all the software, which includes device drivers, um, workload management, container runtimes, you name it. I'll, I'll go through the stacks in a little bit. Um, we then go through the integration phase where we configure all of that installed software and we join all of the individual servers in this software defined cluster configuration together into a fully integrated cluster. So we handle the, the generation of, of the Slurm config. We handle the cube, uh, the process of doing the Kubernetes join to bring the, the compute nodes into the manager node. And, um, put all of the necessary components on top of that, including services and whatnot on the Kubernetes side that we'll talk about in a little bit. And with this intelligent deployment um, component, you can actually do it in two different ways. From the control plane, since we're running AWX, you can do a graphical deployment of your logical clusters using AWX. You can go through the AWX dashboard, you can select which hosts you want as part of your logical cluster, and then you can deploy that cluster on top of your resource pool. But for those of us that are more comfortable with the keyboard than the mouse, you can also use the command line and you can use Ansible directly using the Ansible playbook command to um, run uh, the Omnia playbooks using a pre-built inventory. And one of the advantages of this approach is you can, you can keep everything in a textual format. You can keep copies of your inventories. You can check those inventories into uh, GitHub or wherever you keep your um, your inventory list. And then the, you know at any given time how you've changed your deployments, how you've changed those logical clusters. You can roll back to previous configurations and it gives you the ability to really keep track of, of uh, how you've changed your, your resource pool over time. Okay, so I mentioned before, we do a lot of uh, software installation configuration uh, through the intelligent deployment phase. So let's talk about the current stacks. Omnia uh, builds two different configurations and it can run them independently on a cluster or it can run them both simultaneously. The first is the Slurm stack and we have um, two different variants. Uh, we can use a very traditional Slurm stack where we're installing uh, libraries and compilers and runtimes uh, directly into the OS layer and we try and leverage other work from other good projects uh, wherever we can. So in this case, we, we can actually deploy OpenHPC RPMs directly on top of um, uh, the base Omnia deployment. And that gives us the, the compiler runtime library and user application stacks that we're used to. We can, uh, we're even exploring the installation of SPAC as a way of handling the bare metal kind of OS layer deployment of applications um, uh, through the SPAC system. So, so you can do a very traditional Slurm uh, deployment. This way you can see we can support both um, bare metal physical hardware as well as virtual hardware. We can actually also support uh, cloud infrastructure as a service as well. Because Ansible is dependent only on having a host name or IP address, as long as the networking is set up, you can actually run um, Omnia and generate logical clusters using Omnia on any type of infrastructure, so long as you have uh, have that IP address you can SSH to. But what we're looking at in terms of kind of the next generation of what we'll call traditional simulation modeling systems is moving away from a bare metal OS installation of all of the software packages to a containerized approach. And you see we have the same base layers here 
with hardware and host OS or virtual hardware and virtual OS. Um, uh, accelerator driver deployment, all done automatically and intelligently uh, through Omnia. Installing a container runtime, we currently use Singularity as our container runtime um, on the Slurm side of things. We install the Slurm scheduler uh, and then we can deploy containers um, from all sorts of different places uh, to give the most optimized configurations of particular applications, um, whether that be uh, accelerate, uh, optimized containers from NVIDIA for uh, running uh, on NVIDIA GPUs, whether that be accelerated uh, optimized containers from Intel One Container Registry, which is a, a place where you can get optimized containers for running on Intel hardware um, or any other host, any host of other places. So you can just deploy those containers that make the most sense on top of this framework and then just allow singularity in this case to handle the, the, the kickstart of the, the application through the container. We also do Kubernetes. Um, and like I said, we can run both Slurm and Kubernetes together on the same logical cluster, or we can run independent logical clusters, um, each running one of one of the two different uh, resource managers. Um, same thing applies here. We intelligently deploy those accelerator drivers. We deploy uh, the container runtime. For Kubernetes, we're currently using Docker, but we're um, preparing to open that up to a list of other possibilities, including Podman and Cryo. Um, and Containerd, the host of different Run C container runtimes. Um, we install the orchestration layer, uh, which we get directly from Google through the Kubernetes uh, repositories. Um, and then we install all of the other pieces that are necessary to make Kubernetes useful, including the different operators and extensions. We install Helm 3, we install the operator lifecycle manager, which was part of OpenShift, but has now been uh, given to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as an open project. We then uh, deploy services on top of that using those frameworks, including the MPI operator, the, um, the uh, Spark operator, excuse me, and then a host of load balance and ingress services so that you can actually provide IP addresses to any persistent services that are running, as well as do port forwarding and other uh, ingress services. And then just like with the containerized Slurm stack, you can run these containers um, right on top. And that includes full platforms as well. So Omnia has a set of uh, playbooks that allow you to deploy Kubeflow um, as a one-touch deployment, um, taking, that taking that deployment straight from Google, modifying it so that it will work on bare metal infrastructure as opposed to inside of Google Kubernetes engine, and then uh, providing that a resource to you where you can take advantage of those accelerators in your in your solution. You can take advantage of your fast network. You can take advantage of your internal storage, and and still run that Kubeflow platform that gives you interactive you know development with Jupyter notebooks. It gives you the ability to run things like NVIDIA Rapids containers to do uh, distributed data analytics. It gives you Katib for doing hyperparameter tuning and a whole host of other features like pipelining and model re recording and registry and things like that. So, um, and we're looking to expand, ex expand that list of platforms as we go along. Um, right now, Omnia is, a, is an opinion of a, a pair of different uh, stacks that we can deploy, but we're, we're growing the project um, to be uh, more of an open framework so that we can, we can have other options inside and then as users of Omnia decide they want to deploy different clusters, they can pick the pieces that make the most sense to them. So it may not make sense for a, someone to deploy Kubeflow. Maybe they want to deploy something like Converge IO, or they want to deploy um, you know, something like Polyaxon or something like that. So you can deploy all of, the goal would be to deploy all of those types of things um, on top of that Kubernetes stack through Omnia and have those all available in the Omnia repositories. And so now I wanna hand it over to John and we're going to walk through the process of building the, the Omnia control plane and deploying a logical cluster. All right, thanks Luke. So what would a walkthrough be without having uh, some live demo? Um, so of course we're gonna, we're gonna go for it and show you everything we can. Um, let me share this screen here and 
I will full screen this. So um, the first thing, of course, that we need to do every time we build a system is um, actually bootstrap that, uh, that initial appliance. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. We've been doing this for years, either walking around with a, a USB drive or a long ago with a, uh, some other media. Um, but kickstarts uh, and pixie booting has clearly been a de facto standard. We've been using it for a long time. Uh, but configuring the cobbler server uh, hasn't always been super easy um, and it's not doesn't lend itself to kind of just kind of anybody using it. So what we did was we tried to, uh, as Luke explained, sort of lay this all out in a, in a playbook so that you can really just kind of one touch these systems and then you have an appliance here that's running. So um, what we have here is in this uh, in this quick little video is, um, a system that we had just installed with CentOS 7 Minimal, um, just the latest release of it, no updates to it, um, and just you know, kind of as small as we can go. Um, this system was up for about eight minutes when we started the video and just kind of wanted to show you that, hey, this is just the seventh, Cent 7 release. Um, and basically all we need to do is install a few packages to get started uh, with just yum, we don't do anything anything crazy. We just install the uh, extra packages for enterprise Linux, as I'm sure everybody's used to. Uh, and we do that, of course, so that we can get a, a reasonable version of Ansible uh, and Git. And in this case, I also installed wgit because I uh, downloaded the uh, Omnia release tarball directly from the uh, directly from the GitHub page. You can also just do a git check uh, git clone. Uh, of the release branch itself, and that'll do the same thing for you. Um, again, wanted to make it easy to get started. Um, and this is probably the only bit of command line that you actually need. Although, you know, to me, that's kind of the same world that I've always lived in. So John, are, are you thinking yeah. you're sharing your slides right now? Am I not sharing anything? We're not sharing, no. Oh, it's, oh, I didn't click share. Now I'm sharing. And you can see that, right? Yes. Okay. So I just talked you through that first bit. We just did a, a, a yum install of just uh, Apple and Ansible. Uh, I grabbed that release tarball uh, from GitHub itself, uh, which is out there and you can download and play with whenever you want. Uh, we go right in there and there's really only some very basic configuration that you need uh, for setting up the appliance itself. Again, that appliance, all it is is a... Um, a server that is running cobbler with a pixie image uh, and a another uh, server image that's running an AWX um, instance. And AWX is the upstream of Ansible Tower. It's another open source uh, project. And again, we tried to build everything off of anything open source that we can. Um, so we're not trying to reinvent anything. We're just trying to use the tools that exist out there for us. Um, you can set some defaults uh, for your Omnia install in terms of what uh, network you want Kubernetes to use, uh, the software defined network and, uh, and a MariaDB password for your Slurm backend. Um, and then the appliance itself, it really only has a few options here. Um, a provisioning password, that's the password that's going to be set on all of your compute nodes. Um, I use something really secure here of course, uh, so uh, FUBAR 2021 uh, for this demo. And then we set just that, what is that internal HPC NIC gonna be? Uh, in this case, we've got uh, Mellanox Connect X5 cards that are configured in uh, ethernet mode. And um, so we're gonna use that as our 100 gig internal uh, network. And then I have a copy of the, uh, the CentOS 7 ISO, and I'm gonna point that in that uh, configuration file as well. Um, and right now, of course, we're, we're limiting to just Cent 7, uh, as everybody has kind of tried to make a decision about what's going to happen with CentOS 8. Um, now that we're finally seeing the, uh, you know, full releases of the Cent 8 clones that will be supported through uh, either Rocky or Alma, um, we've, act we've started to do quite a bit of development in uh, making sure that it works in both OSs. And eventually, we don't really care what OS at all. Um, this other thing that I'm showing you here is a, a mapping file uh, for, you know, our traditional HPC systems where people like to treat the uh, servers like pets and give them names. Uh, we can still support that uh, model, uh, dumping a MAC address, 
uh, giving that system a, a, a name like, you know, a cabinet or compute something and, and applying an IP address. You don't have to do that though. Um, we do like to think about just treating the data center as a bunch of cattle. Things will come in and things will come out and we don't really care what it's called or where it is as long as it's responding. Um, so you don't have to put in the mapping file. If you don't want to, we'll just automatically uh, create a naming scheme based off of the DHCP scheme that you create. So uh, if you take a look at the last uh, settings that we're gonna do here at the bottom is setting that DHCP range um, and for this one, I set it up for, you know, 56 or so uh, systems, although I really, I only have five in this demo to show you, but, um, you know, just to give you the idea that you can, you can kind of do that. That's pretty much it for configuration. Um, now for the, the, the wonderfully boring part, you basically just run the playbook. Um, and it's just Ansible playbook appliance.yaml from this folder. Uh, we actually just created some updates so you don't even have to declare uh, what type of Python interpreter we're automatically choosing based on what kind of system you're using. Um, and most of the time defaulting to Python 3 when we can. Um, we've made all of the package installs very generic so that we can move between operating systems uh, without a whole lot of problems. And I'm not gonna show you this whole video. This is just the running of an Ansible playbook. You can go out to the GitHub and actually look at each of these tasks and what they're doing and how it's setting up your firewall, uh, what packages it's actually installing. And on uh, this is a um, R740XD uh, and it takes about, 15 minutes to run this, uh, to run this. And when, when we're done, we actually have a uh, working cobbler server and an AWX server uh, that are um, actually both running in a container. Um, so that's kind of the really neat part there. I'll just gonna skip ahead here. You'll see what the, the final output looks like. It checks to make sure that the server gets started. Uh, and then at the end we say, okay, look, uh, everything looks okay, nothing failed. Um, so we should be good to go and we have a, have a system ready to rock. Um, and what I did with, uh, what I can show you now is what we've now created is this dash, this uh, AWX interface. Um, so we have, again, two containers running on this appliance server. Uh, one is the AWX interface and the other is the cobbler interface. And what we have done is the cobbler container is actually attached to that internal network so that any system that tries to pixie boot inside of the, uh, the HPC network, the high-speed fabric. Um, Cobbler will grab it. If it sees it in that mapping file, it'll apply the rules that you've created. If it doesn't uh, know who it is, it will just create a, uh, uh, something out of that DHCP pool that you, that you uh, opened up. And then what we have here in AWX is we've queued up a bunch of jobs to run uh, uh, automatically, uh, specifically the dynamic inventory. And this just runs every 10 minutes right now and queries the cobbler server that it's sitting right next to and says, hey, did you see any new nodes? I'd like to add them to my inventory if you did. And so what I've, what I've done here is I pixie booted five hosts yesterday. Um, and you can see uh, just from my chart here, uh, how we're looking at, uh, looks like the nodes came up on the third and then we were configuring them on the fourth. Uh, and I was playing around with them again this morning. As you can see, I've got some of my uh, recently used templates uh, where I, I have a failed job. And then here you can take a look at why did that fail? Was there, a, and, and in this case, it was a node that was um, misconfigured. Um, so I had, to, I had to reshoot it and get it ready to go. And now we can see that as of uh, 8.52 this morning, um, the cluster was back up and running uh, and everything was happy. And what does that mean uh, when I get it all up and running? Well, we've built these templates that uh, you can just use and run. Um, First, let me go look at the inventory. So here is that uh, inventory that we've created automatically from the cobbler server. Um, it will just ingest that information and we pull a little bit of info just to give you a snapshot of what is that system? Uh, is the BIOS updated? Um, you know, are they all BIOS same, same versions? Do they have the right amount of memory uh, cores? That sort of thing, what kind of processors in them? And what we can do now, as Luke was showing you, you know, about creating an entire data center of systems is that that whole data center doesn't all have to act as one large cluster. What we really like to see now is how can I create um, smaller subclusters inside of this entire infrastructure? Um, maybe sometimes I do want to build one large monolithic system. And in that case, I can just assign how many managers I want and all the rest of them as compute uh, systems. 
But in this case, I said, you know, for the demo, I just want to have uh, three of these systems up and running. Uh, so they're ready to go. I got these other two and I'll show you what I can do with those in a minute. Um, but what I did was I basically just uh, applied these uh, groups, uh, group roles to these uh, nodes themselves. And uh, so what I have is a uh, manager systems. And in this case, uh, our manager is our login node and our, uh, our Slurm controller. Uh, the computes are just, as you would think, computes. But you, what you might notice is we don't label, is this a GPU compute or is this uh, just a CPU or is this um, an FPGA node? And we don't have to for these playbooks because they have all of the uh, smarts built inside of the playbook itself so that when it runs through, it'll query uh, the PCI bus for things that we're looking for, like NVIDIA uh, GPUs, uh, Intel FPGAs, Xilinx FPGAs, et cetera. And we'll just go ahead and install the correct driver set for those. Um, so now that I have an inventory here and I've labeled uh, managers and compute nodes, we have templates that have been created. And these templates just allow you to click and run the playbook. Now you don't have to click and run the playbook. You can actually go right back to your command line. Uh, just like we deployed the uh, AWX uh, and Cobbler instance, you can go right to the command line and Ansible playbook run the omnia.yaml. You can provide it your own uh, inventory files if you don't like, uh, if, you're, if you're not, you know, don't want to use this. Uh, but the automatically created inventory files are also dumped there into your, uh, into that repo where you started from. So um, we'll take a look at the deploy Omnia real quick because basically what this template will do is deploy the entire system. By default, it installs uh, Slurm and Kubernetes and makes them both schedulable uh, just so that it's quick and easy to get up and running on a system. Um, it will pull from that Omnia inventory that we've automatically created. Uh, we automatically dump in credentials uh, for, the, for the system so that it can get, to, get around. And, and then here's the playbook itself. We actually have quite a few other ones that you can take a look at, but uh, the Omnia playbook is the one that we would run here. And since I've already run this on that inventory set, I'm not gonna run it again. What I can do is actually show you what happened the last time it ran. So we can look at our previous jobs and uh, we'll look for a deploy in here. And we can see here's that last successful uh, Omnia deployment. It was a full playbook run. And what you can do in here is you can actually see the entire playbook output, everything that happened uh, in, that, uh, in that run, where things were changed. Uh, if you really need to dig down, if you have some uh, issues, what will happen is you'll get errors up here and you can actually click through to those uh, error tasks, let you drill down into what happened. Uh, you know, was, it, uh, was the network misconfigured? Was it not able to get out to the internet? These sort of things. Um, and, you know, for your own sake, you can review, hey, this is everything that happens and how this works. Um, at the end here, we have, uh, uh, which is the idea is that everything looks like it was okay and we didn't have any failures. Uh, we may have skips and ignores because those are, uh, right now we just have certain logic depending on how things uh, happen and while you're building the system. Um, some things we just ignore and some things they're not necessarily uh, needed to run on computes or they're not needed to run on the manager system itself. So now that I have uh, run this, uh, this playbook itself, I actually have a, uh, a running system here, um, just like you would expect uh, from your regular clusters. Um, we've got uh, a Slurm installation. I've got one queue that just is automatically set up with the compute nodes that are out there. Uh, you can you can do simple things like an S run right off the bat, um, and that's great and all. But of course, as we all know, that doesn't really help our users in the end. This helps our admin. Uh, you know, pretty quickly, bam, they're up and running a Slurm system. Don't have to know a whole lot about how to configure it. But if you do, you can dig down into those playbooks and make all the modifications that you want. We just provide a base uh, Slurm comp um, and you know, kind of best practices to show you which way to go. Um, what we're not doing yet right now is actually um, installing any other packages or compilers or anything like that because we really do feel that the, the, the way to properly deliver software is in a containerized environment. Um, you know, our admins, our HPC specialists always spend a fair amount of their time configuring 
uh, you know, the multitude of different compiler stacks, different MPI stacks, different libraries for all of those combinations, and then applications built on top of all that. And what we'd really like to see is people start to use the, uh, the vendor supplied containers that are out there. NVIDIA provides them, uh, Intel provides them, Xilinx provides them. So you don't have to build this uh, large bare metal uh, system. We can, we can just use containers even on the bare metal side. Uh, in this case, we're gonna use it through Singularity. So I've got um, just a, some simple ones just to get, get us started. The, the classic Singularity hello world. Uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, batch file, something that everybody's probably familiar with. Um, we're just going to run this on one node. And in this case, I actually just pull it directly from uh, the Singularity Hub and say, let's go ahead and execute that. And uh, we can do that right now. And hooray. You can see I did run a couple of jobs this morning. The job already finished because it's pretty much just a hello world. And I'm fairly certain I've already downloaded it. So we can take a look at that uh, test output there. And this is what I think is really neat about the, uh, the ability to deliver your software in a container rather than building all of the software for all of your users. What I have, what I'm demonstrating here is using a crusty old version of Ubuntu. Uh, why? I, it's just the one that was provided with uh, the singularity test. But as I've always found when working with users, they're either using some really old version of a library because it's the last time they knew that their code worked, or they're using something so new that it just came out last month and we're scratching our heads on how are we gonna get all this new software onto the system on a monthly basis. So I really like this, this way to deliver the software because now it's not up to the admin and the HPC specialist to determine which compiler is the right compiler and which, uh, and which libraries are the right libraries. You basically just need to provide the, the underlying infrastructure, which is just the OS and the, uh, and the drivers for your, uh, for your accelerators and for your network. A um, couple of other quick ones we can see. Uh, this LAMPS test is actually um, from the NVIDIA NGC. Um, we actually will grab this right from uh, NVIDIA's NGC uh, repository. And again, this is one where the, the folks at NVIDIA have spent a lot of time and effort to optimize this build for their GPUs. And so if you have NVIDIA GPUs, wouldn't you want to use the, uh, the, the version that they've kind of blessed and have said, you know, this is going to be the, the ultimate version. And same thing, you can just go ahead and launch things like that. Um, right into your uh, into your batch scheduled system. And again, now I'm not providing this whole build of, of software tool chain for my users. Uh, let's see if that already finished. It sure did, it's a fast test. Um, and that one was actually using four GPUs on the system here. Um, I do have a UCX error still, I will fix that. Um, but in this case, you know, I'm able to actually take advantage of the GPUs. I'm able to take advantage of MPI. Um, I'm able to uh, do all this without having to do a big heavy lift on the user side. And then uh, the other part that we've uh, really started to dig in on and really enjoy is that OpenHPC project has started to deploy, uh, has started to basically build their environment in a containerized system. And so now what I can do is it doesn't really matter what sort of platform you want, go ahead and build your own. Are you, uh, you know, using OpenHPC? That's great. I actually just took a Singularity uh, and rebuilt a, uh, rebuilt the existing uh, MPI uh, CC with uh, MVAP Hitch 2. And um, we can, you can run in these environments, I'll show you like this, uh, a batch job here. We can just run these and actually build software using that environment. And I don't have it all installed here locally. Um, which GCC do I have on here? I've got GCC 4.8. And of course, you know, it's old. Um, a lot of users are going to complain that's your base GCC. Well, go ahead and grab that open HPC container. Um, let's take a look at my hello, uh, hello world. And now I can just actually run this. You remember all my history. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that container that I just grabbed that is the, uh, the OpenHPC environment and I'm gonna compile this hello world. And of course I can do that on the back end. I can do this on the front end. It doesn't, you know, to me, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, the demonstration here is that I don't need to build all of this uh, infrastructure for my users now. Now I have this, like I just have the, uh, uh, the exact, uh, right compiler versions and everything that I want. We can take a look at what version that is. And I believe it's nine. 
Um, so now I've got GCC 9.3. And this took me, you know, a matter of minutes to download the container and, and, and run this. So I'm really relieving the users from all of that or the admins and the, and the, uh, and our HPC specialists from having to build all these crazy environments for people. Now that's all cool because of course we're the HPC community and we're used to doing stuff with our Slurm batch scheduled work and everything is uh, you know set into the queue and I'll get my data later. But on the data science side, it's become a lot harder. They need that interactive world uh, and, they need, and they need to be able to, to do stuff um, you know, kind of uh, interactively and at, uh, at will. So, we also go ahead and deploy uh, Kubeflow as a platform on top of Kubernetes. So now I can take advantage of uh, the pipelines uh, for building, um, let's take a real quick look at the pipeline so you can see, you know, for building uh, complex uh, workflows, um, you can, it's got nice uh, kind of block style building, or if you wanna dig in, you can write your own YAML too. Um, cause you know, everybody loves that. You can do all sorts of experiments, create runs, uh, pipelines is a pretty neat, pretty neat, uh, uh program. You've also got Katib, uh, if you want to be doing, uh, hyperparameter searches, neural architecture searches, uh, and same thing, you can kick off a bunch of experiments and run these interactively. So you can really look at your data. Um, but one of the larger uses that we see is of course, using, uh, Jupyter notebooks. And so I did just kick off uh, right before this talk started uh, a Rapids uh, uh, instance. This is again from NVIDIA NGC. I didn't have to build anything. I just grabbed it. Um, I did uh, modify the, the container a little bit um, to make it run here in, in Kubeflow and we document how to do that. Um, and then you can just connect right into it. And uh, if, you, if you like, there's a couple of different interfaces. You can see the tree, you can see the full lab interface. Um, and we have, you know, things that we can do interactively now. We can actually just start using a GPU, uh, looking through some data. Um, you know, we can view what kind of GPUs we've got. In this instance, I'm using some uh, some some older V100s. Um, you can find out which, uh, what uh, version of the compiler you have, all that sort of thing. But I mean, the cool part is really being able to to generate data being able to visualize that data as we're as we're working and that's where the you know where we're really trying to enable the data scientist side of these systems um now uh we'll go back to uh the concept of wanting to uh run multiple types of systems in your uh in your data center well what's really neat is i can just take this inventory which currently has uh all of my hosts and i can just say you know let me make a copy of that and um, I'll change this to call like my sub inventory, just sub something something easy. And we can change the uh, the number of hosts that are in here. So you know what? These other hosts are already associated with the system. Let's go ahead and dump those out. Uh, we don't need we don't want to duplicate. So we can say I'm just going to use these other two systems right here, and we can assign them roles now. Um, now we can say, uh, what, what group is this system going to be in? Um, we can assign it to, um, make one a manager and make one a compute system. Same, same sort of setup. One needs to be able to log in. The other one needs to be able to execute jobs. Um, we do also have this set up so that you can, um, you can run on a single system, a single, uh, server. If you need, a this a cube flow, this Jupyter lab interface. Um, and you just want to just want to get it up and running on a single system or in the cloud or uh, in a VM. Um, so, you know, try to make it simple to be able to get to these tools that everybody's using. Um, so we'll make this guy a compute. And then I can come into my templates again. And I could deploy Omnia, but on a different inventory set. And maybe on this one, I don't want to do a uh, slurm. I'll just do, uh, I'll just do Kubernetes on this one. So we can skip through different tags. We could either skip the Kubernetes side or we could skip the, uh, the slurm side. Uh, we'll save that and just launch it off when it gets saved. And now I have, now I have these other two nodes that are going to be kicking off into a, a Kubernetes system. And we don't have to sit there and watch it, but people can now go and we can kind of build and destroy systems at will, however we like, um, and then keep giving these interfaces to the, to the people who need them. Um, 
I have a few minutes. I'll show you just a couple of other uh, couple of other uh, dashboards that we have. Uh, if you haven't seen the the Kubernetes dashboard, let me just grab this token real quick, and um, you can see you can see quite a bit of good information inside of the Kubernetes dashboard about. Uh, what's running, what systems are actually being uh, utilized, uh, how much, uh, you know, how much load you're getting, uh, if systems are starting to, to get overloaded, because of, of course we can share nodes. Um, and uh, so all sorts of good info inside of the basic Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, we've also um, used the Prometheus dashboard for getting a little bit more fine grained uh, information. And what we also added was the Slurm exporter uh, that they just uh, created, the Slurm group created. And that Slurm exporter now uploads all of its data into Prometheus, as does our Kubernetes system. So now we can look at uh, side by side, uh, you know, Slurm queue information, uh, Spark operator information, TensorFlow information, any of that sort of thing. And, you know, that's, it's a really quick view into the system of uh, where you're hitting, um, you know, where you're hitting high utilization. And it can help you as an admin decide, maybe I, uh, my Slurm site is getting a little light. Um, and I need more Kubernetes or the other way around. I only have a few researchers right now using Kubernetes and everybody's using the, uh, the batch scheduled system. It allows you to kind of get a view into the system and, and help to make those decisions. All right. I am up at my time limit, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, maybe there's a time for a question or two. We could do lightning round questions. I think Luke has a slide or two. Yes, here we go. Mm hmm I just wanted to take a second. I know we uh, we started a little late and uh, we've kind of come up against the time limit, but we want to be sure we answer everybody's questions. So if we can't get to them here really quickly, join the community. Uh, you can find Omnia on GitHub. It's at github.com slash DellHPC slash Omnia. Um, you can also join the Omnia Slack channel. It's part of the Dell HPC uh, Slack team. So if you go to dellhpc.slack.com, the, the channel is hashtag Omnia. Uh, you can join there, ask questions, uh, give suggestions, uh, complain, whatever it is, uh, we're happy to take the feedback. So with that, uh, we will try to answer a few questions. All right, we are running a little short of time, but I wanna get to these questions because there's some real good ones. It takes too much time to promote people to live and get them set up on their end. So we're gonna do lightning round answering on these questions with John and Luke. Uh, and I'll even knock out one here real quick. Richard Hill asks, is Omni included with every Dell HPC system? Is there a license fee? It is not included. Customer choice always in how to do this. We support both an enterprise uh, cluster management system, Bright Computing's uh, uh, Bright Cluster Manager, and they're going to present in a few weeks as well. And so you'll see that as soon as uh, we fig figure out a final date. Um, that is one option. Uh, customers still can choose Open HPC. They can choose Omnia on Intel-based nodes now. This is a joint project for this first year with Dell and Intel. So for this, actually, anyone can deploy it, but the support version comes uh, on Intel nodes only. But it's open source, so it can run on anything. Uh, and so it will not be deployed by default. It's still customer choice. And uh, you know we hope it's a good choice for you all. Um, Luke, why don't you take uh, Clement Lau's question? Okay, so Clement asks if there are advantages of using Bright Cluster Manager to do the bare metal provisioning, um, as opposed to, that's something we should talk about separately, Clement. I'm not really sure what you're, you're referring to. I don't know if we have time to unmute Clement and let him ask his question in a more detailed way. Um, you could definitely let Bright Cluster Manager do the bare metal provisioning, mm -hmm. um, but Bright already has so many of these other features built in. They have a very well curated set of tools and capabilities. They have dashboards and, and um, it, full integration for complete lifecycle management of a cluster. So if you're going to go the Bright route, it's a great route. And I think um, I, if, you're, if you're prepared to be part of the Bright ecosystem, um, I would just stick with the Bright ecosystem. Um, John, Vinod asks, how does Omnia compare with OpenHPC? You want to give a quick answer to that? Sure. Um, well, we actually incorporate OpenHPC into our stuff, uh, which is great. Um, the, the, the comparison is we're still creating that Slurm cluster. It's trying to give that same experience, but we're also trying to add on the, the full Kubernetes experience. 
Um, so that's that's kind of the uh, the add-on. And then again, we're, we're building right off of OpenHPC um, and using their environments because I mean, they're great for the uh, grabbing the compilers, for grabbing that standard MPI stack, uh, um, you know, see a lot of use in that. Okay, Martin, Martin DeVries from, uh, from Bright actually asked a couple of questions on here. Um, Let me take his first one. Um, his first one, yeah. About uh, the question was, how do you support different types of servers in a single infrastructure um, when they have different nicknames? So, um, at NIC names. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, the appliance config is only for that single system to, you have to point it specifically to what uh, adapter are you gonna bind to uh, for the cobbler instance. Uh, but the compute systems themselves, we don't care. Uh, whatever is the default that is, that is populated right now, um, we're looking at other options for what to do when there's multiple NICs. Right, so we're, right. we're looking at building some systems right now to detect what NICs are actually up and available and have you know cables plugged into them, determining their speed and trying to figure out what the fabric looks like uh, based on that information through Ansible facts. So we'll, um, that, that's a part of the project that'll be growing as we go along. And do you wanna quickly address Rohit Sharma's related question? Yeah, so this goes back to what we can do with having a collection of facts from, from the, the, the net, net address info uh, and from the OS distribution info, we can we can figure out what the the interface names are, and that'll be part of uh, that would be part of the custom fact gathering that we do, which we currently do for accelerators, but we want to expand that into the network space as well, so that we can figure out how to build those fabrics on the fly, um, even if the NICs are in different locations or have different names. And it is 10:59. We always try to end on time. Again, apologies to everybody for the seven minute late start today. Some Zoom technical difficulties that still don't understand why we had them, it worked like magic on the sixth effort. So um, this recording will be available. Uh, you can reach out to John and Luke with additional questions. We also encourage you to ask questions in the Omnia Slack channel. At one point, we weren't sure if we were gonna use that. We we're just gonna direct everybody to GitHub, but lately there's been some interest in having that Slack channel. So we're going to reinvigorate the Slack channel as well as use GitHub. So um, we also have a presentation from, as I mentioned, Bright Computing coming up, we'll schedule that next. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks, Luke and John. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.